means that all the existing components within that feed gas turn into something different. That's stoichiometry. Stoichiometry for, for gasoline is, is around 14.7 to 1 air fuel mixture. So again, the O2 sensor rides at about 900 millivolts, give or take, when it detects a lack of oxygen in the exhaust stream. It rides about 200 millivolts when it detects an abundance of oxygen in the exhaust stream. So the O2 sensor does this when it sees a lean mixture, and it does this when it sees a rich mixture. Fuel trim is that corrective factor. Short-term fuel trim is a correction to this. So what happens is this. If this is fuel trim here, okay, and this is zero, and this is positive 25, and this is negative 25, I'll get out of the way here in a second. We start off here as this oxygen sensor starts to trend down. Let's say it gets to around 200 millivolts here. The computer, this switch is very close to stoichiometry, up and down. It's when it's really accurate. The computer will start to add fuel. It's going to add fuel until this starts to switch. And when this starts to go this way, once it crosses a threshold here, the computer is going to start taking away fuel until this switches again. And it's going to add fuel and take away fuel and add fuel. Right there, that's usually plus or minus. Oops. This is harder to do than I thought. Plus or minus 5% is, is what we like to see when we say a car is in good fuel control. So again, all this up and down with the oxygen sensor and fuel trim is designed to satisfy the functionality of the cap. I know I spit a lot at you, but does it make sense, the method to their madness here? What we're trying to accomplish? It does? Five-base fuel calculation or, or an injector misfire or anything like that. And we don't consider it to be a global problem, whatever it is, because it's only one cylinder. Does that make sense? So if it was something having to do with a mass airflow sensor, wouldn't you expect that to affect all the cylinders? This says it's, it's cylinder number one that's misfired. Assuming our scan tool is right. Can scan tools make mistakes? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they can. I see people pull the wrong cylinder heads. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they got a PO301, it was actually cylinder number four. That was one time too. Yeah, and that happens. That does happen, they assume. Uh, that problem's not as prevalent as it was in years past. It gotten, the software's gotten a lot stronger, so you don't have to worry about that much, as much anymore. Hmm. So again, we're going to apply our four-step process just like we did earlier. Operating the vehicle at idle, operating the vehicle at elevated RPM with no load, operating under brake torque, which is low RPM and high load, and then wide open throttle if need be, which is very high RPM and very high load, puts the engine under all the operating conditions basically available for it to run, and we're going to look back at our fuel trim to infer when our fault is or is not present. We're going to use that as a diagnostic step. So at idle, no load, let's analyze the data here. By way of where our cursor is plotted here, we see we are in fuel control here because the O2 sensor is going up and down. This is bank two, sensor one. But look at bank one, sensor one. Meaning one half of the engine's oxygen sensor versus the other one. What's the, what are you seeing different from one to the other? What do you, what do you guys see? So the, what looks different from this one to this one? Is it a difference in amplitude? High to low? It's more active, meaning more frequency, right? This is what we should be seeing. This is what we're seeing here. Remember I told you an oxygen sensor doesn't really sense oxygen? or fuel, lack thereof, there's, there's catalysis that actually takes place in that sensor. And this is the part that I don't want to deviate down that path because, again, I can spend a lot of time talking about it. But as that oxygen from the misfiring cylinder gets pumped downstream and then it disappears and then it appears again every time that cylinder misfires, that causes that rapid up and down oscillation. What I'm getting at here is this is free info for you guys. This is a strong indication that there's a misfire taking place. Like this. Relative to the pressure in this room, how much pressure is in the cylinder? Syringe. Same. Zero. The same. Yeah. So there's zero difference. So zero PSI. If I put my finger over the end and I close this and I squeeze this as hard as I can, let's say I produce 100 PSI of compression. Just nice round numbers, right? If I went like this all the way up to what we call top dead center, like an engine, and I came back down again without taking my thumb off here, what would pressure again be when I got all the way down to the bottom where I started? 
Zero. 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 Because nothing came in or out, right? So that's what we should expect to see on a cylinder here. On a, excuse me, on a compression show. And that's what's going on right here. This is pressure, up and down, and this is time. So as the piston heads up towards top that center of the compression stroke, the area in that syringe becomes what? Smaller. And if no air comes out and the area gets smaller, what has to happen to pressure? Increases. Is that a Mercedes-Benz thing? Or a BMW thing? Or a Ford thing? It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's, a, it's an internal combustion engine. So as the cylinder gets smaller, no air comes out, pressure has to go up. And then the piston comes back down again, and this is the part I didn't talk about here. So we talked about how I go up and I come down and pressure's the same. What if I went up and a little bit of air came out, right? Instead of making 100 PSI, I only made 80. As I start to pull this down, won't I get down to zero faster? Yeah. What happens if I keep going with my thumb on the end? Negative, Negative pressure, like a vacuum. So if we started off here with atmospheric pressure, and this repeats over and over and over again. This area is the same as this area. This area is this area. It's just repeating itself. Shouldn't these be the same? If there's no leak, would you agree with that? Where we started with, where we came down with? That's, that's good, that's desirable. So instead of starting with atmospheric pressure here, the engine's running, we're starting off with manifold vacuum, 20 inches of mercury, which is about normal for sea level here. So we started off with vacuum, we went up on compression. If we lost nothing, we should come right back down the manifold back again. Make sense? So that's what you're seeing here. Right here, there's a pressure, there's a change in pressure. This is pressure and this is time. There's a rapid change in pressure in a very short amount of time. Right here is where the exhaust valve opens. Right here, the piston starts to head north again on the exhaust stroke. Why are we not building pressure here? Because the exhaust valve is open. Does that make sense? So now the piston's coming up and it's pushing air out the exhaust port. We get over here to the 360 mark, which is once around. This is top dead center of the exhaust stroke again. Right here, there's a rapid change in pressure. It went negative. What happened right here? The intake valve opened. So the manifold that had is a big storage device for vacuum has vacuum stored in it. As soon as the intake valve opened, this cylinder was exposed to manifold vacuum. It pulled it down. The piston continues down now, and it's contributing to the intake manifold until we get to bottom dead center, which is right here in the 540 mark. That's where the piston changes direction and starts to go up on compression again. So if the piston changes direction here, how come we're not building pressure here? If the piston starts going up, shouldn't we be building pressure here? If the cylinder was sealed, right? The intake valve has not yet closed. So the piston's moving up, but it's still open up here. So what do you think happened right here? Close. Intake valve closed, and then we start to build pressure. So this is how a pressure waveform works. That's the information that's located inside it. What I'm interested in is, is what I call these good characteristics, these points of significance here. I want to see good compression that depends on the stroke of the motor and stuff like that. That's a specification. I want to see straight towers. The significance of that is we build pressure at the same way we lose pressure. I don't want to get too involved here. When they're straight, it's good. When they're leaning, it indicates a leak. And we want to see defined valve events here. When something opens and closes, if it's healthy, we're going to see rapid changes in pressure, <clears throat> just like that. So knowing that, I'm going into this diagnosis here.